Hi everyone, welcome back to the History in 20 podcast at long last. It's been a long time, I know I've been very busy moving house and so on, so it's been a very busy time, so I haven't had much time to get on with these, but we're back at last. So here we go, we're going even further back than we've ever been before on this podcast, and today we are talking about Alexander the Great. So, a little bit of information as we always do, his little personal profile. So he was born on either the 20th or 21st of July, 356 BCE, which just means before Common Era, same as BC, and ACE after Common Era, same as AD. So if you use those terms, that's what it means. So he was born in 356 BCE in Pella and Macedon, which is was part of ancient Greece, is now part of modern-day Macedonia. He died on the 10th or 11th of June, 323 BCE, in Babylon, which was part of Mesopotamia. So one thing to kind of get your head around on this episode is that the dates kind of, it's as if they're going backwards because we're going up to the Common Era. So 356 to 323 was when he was around, not the other way around, as would be after the Common Era, if you get me. So what did he reign as? Who did he reign? Where did he reign? Well, he reigned as King of Macedon from 336 to 323 as Pharaoh of Egypt from 332 to 323, as King of Persia from 330 to 323, and as Lord of Asia from 331 to 323. Um, His full name was Alexander III of Macedon. His spouse, he had three wives. Well, he had a few, but as three, three of his main wives, as you were, were Roxana, who he married in 327 to 323, Ceteria the second, who we married from three two four to three two three, and also Parisatis the second, who married from three two four to three two three as well. Uh, children, he had a few, but main ones are Alexander the fourth of Macedon and Heracles of Macedon, and his dynasty was part of the Argid dynasty. So a bit about Alexander's early life. We'll start off with first. <clears throat> so he was born, like I said, in July three fifty six. BCE to King Philip II of Macedon, which was it was part of an ancient Greek kingdom, and his mother was called Olympias of Epirus. And legend had it that Zeus was Alexander's father, but that was very much a, a posthumous legend, if you will, um, and obviously biologically impossible for him to be his father as well. So, yeah, uh, his early life, we don't really know too much about his early years, but I picked out a few kind of interesting things, just to see what you think of these. So, aged 12, Alexander showed impressive courage when he actually tamed a wild horse called Bucephalus, who became his battle companion for the majority of his life. And this horse was an enormous wild stallion with a furious demeanour. And I don't know much about horses, but I know stallions are nigh on impossible um, to domesticate and train. So, the fact that he trained a wild horse aged 12 uh, is incredible. Then, aged 13, Philip, who, if you remember, was Alexander's father, called on Aristotle, who's another Greek, he was a Greek uh, philosopher that you might have heard of. So Philip called on Aristotle to tutor Alexander, um, and Aristotle was the one responsible for sparking and fostering Alexander's interest in literature, medicine, philosophy, and science. He was a polymath, which means he was knowledgeable in, in anything. Uh, in 338 BC, uh, he was aged 16, uh, Philip, went, Alexander was aged 16 that is, Philip went off to battle and he left Alexander in charge of Macedonia. So Alexander saw his military worth and he led a cavalry charge against the sacred band of Thebes, who were a supposedly unbeatable select army made up entirely of male lovers during the Battle of Charonea. His cavalry decimated the sacred band of, uh, of Thebes. So again, this shows that at such an early age, he was clearly an incredible military leader already. And then the next major milestone in Alexander's life was when he was 20, his father Philip was assassinated at at Alexander's sister's wedding. So at his own daughter's wedding, he was assassinated. And as a result, Alexander became king of Macedon. So Alexander didn't really waste much time in taking on uh, any conquests as soon as he became king. So one of his main sort of objectives was to invade the great Persian Empire that ruled from Anatolia right across to the plains of India. 
Um, Alexander had developed these revolutionary ideas of his own and he believed that Greek civilization was superior and that everyone else were just simply barbarians so that he had a mission to deliver this Greek supremacy to the rest of the world or the known world at the time. So why did he decide on Persia? Well, at the time, the Persian army was the simply the, the largest and most powerful empire of the ancient world at that time in the 300s BCE. So the Persians had been harrying Greece since about about 150 years before Alexander was born, which was during the time of a king called Xerxes. Now, upon Alexander's father's death, he inherited a powerful kingdom and army and a plan to invade the Persian Empire. So in spring 334, he crossed the Dardanelles with an army of about 50,000 men, which included 7,000 cavalry, and he was determined to conquer Persia. And he was going to come up against the Persian king, who was Darius III. And Alexander apparently said, Heaven cannot support two sons, nor can the earth support two masters. So in other words, there's only room for one of us here, was his message, really. Um, so... He crossed the Dardanelles, as I mentioned, and went to meet uh, Darius III in what was known as the Battle of Issus. So they arrived, Alexander's troops, that is, arrived at uh, Issus, which is a town in southern Turkey, in 333, and they encountered a massive Persian army, which was led by King Darius III. So Alexander's forces were hugely outnumbered in men, but the key to this battle was that they were not outnumbered in experience, and obviously the desire to plunder all the Persian wealth. So the battle ensued, and uh, Darius actually fled the battle scene, the Persian king, and his mother was so disappointed with him that she actually disowned him and adopted Alexander as her heir instead of him because he'd shown such cowardice, and that uh, simply wasn't wasn't uh, acceptable uh, to the Persians then. So it was obviously clear that Alexander was a brilliant military leader at this time. He was only in his early 20s, and he would conquer places, towns, cities, etc., under his motto, which was, there is nothing impossible to him who will try, which is a great motto, I think. There is nothing impossible to him who will try. So after Alexander had defeated Darius at the Battle of Issus, he then captured him and he married two of his daughters, uh, as you do, and uh, then the next sort of major event was called the Battle of Tyre, so Alexander took over the Phoenician cities of Marathus and Aridus, and, but he rejected a plea from Darius for peace, and then he took the towns of Byblos and Sidon. He then decided to lay siege to the heavily fortified island of Tyre in January 332, after the Tyrians refused him entry. But Alexander had no navy to speak of, and Tyre was surrounded by water. So how did he then go about conquering this? Well, Alexander instructed his men to build a causeway to reach Tyre, but every time they got near, the Tyrians thwarted their attempts to enter, so they'd throw rocks down, destroy the wooden uh, structures, and so on. So then Alexander realised the only way to get there was to amass a large fleet, which he did, and he breached the, finally breached the city's walls in July 332, and he executed thousands of Tyrians for daring to defy them, the, the Greeks, and then many of the others who were spared their lives were then sold into slavery. Um... And Alexander, from there on, he then entered Egypt. He didn't return home. He then entered Egypt and established a city which still bears his name. Some of you might have visited it, Alexandria. And this wasn't the only Alexandria he founded, actually. He founded about six or seven um, across the uh, across the years, but this is the one that's still standing today. He founded the city of Alexandria in Egypt. And then after conquering Egypt, Alexander still didn't decide to, to return home. Darius was ready to fight again, so he then faced Darius and his troops at Guagamala, Guagamela, sorry, in October 331. So I say that Darius was ready to fight again, but the reality of it was, was that um, after obviously these three years since they'd first met, Alexander had defeated many of Darius's satraps, which were governors of his provinces. And Darius by this point was ready to just buy him off and he promised to cede substantial territory and pay 10,000 talents in gold if Alexander would return to Greece. So when he was told of the offer, Alexander's most senior general, who was a man called Parminio, not Parmo, <laughs> advised, I would accept it if I were Alexander. And Alexander replied to him, and so truly would I if I were Parminio. 
So in the end, Darius was forced to fight, and he amassed a vast, he amassed a vast army near the town of Arbela, which was about two hundred thousand troops, that included these uh, fifteen elephants at least, and these vicious sort of chariots that were called scythe chariots. So they had little like scythes, you know, like you'd cut corn with or wheat. They had those attached to the uh, spokes of the wheels on the side so if they were running past they just take someone's leg off and so on so they were a really really a dangerous dangerous weapon to have and also Darius was carefully picked his ground carefully this time so nearby lay the plain of Guagamela which was perfect terrain for his cavalry and more importantly for the chariots so to ensure his victory he ordered that trees were to be felled and the ground roughly flattened in order to give his superior force a better chance of surrounding the invading Greek force. But when Alexander arrived on the high ground before Darius, his generals urged him to fight immediately. But instead, Alexander instructed his men to rest and sleep, unlike Darius, who had to stay awake with his men all night because he was expecting an assault from Alexander as soon as he arrived. So at this point, the Persians were already knackered by the morning of the battle. They were totally exhausted, whereas the Greeks were all rested and ready to fight. So the day of the battle, the Persian cavalrymen moved forward to charge, but they left a gap in their line into which Alexander simply just led his own horsemen and drove them directly at Darius. Again, Darius fled, and Alexander wheeled them then to attack the enemy's flank, and which started the general disintegration of the Persian army. So, in terms of numbers, approximately 40,000 Persians were killed, and only a few hundred Greeks died on the battlefield. So that's twice that Alexander had defeated an, an, an army that he was completely outnumbered by. So he pursued Darius, but Darius had already been murdered by one of his own generals at this point. And this victory gave Alexander control of the greatest empire of the world at that time. But Alexander was pretty savvy about his kind of relationship that he'd have to develop with this new empire that he'd taken on. Obviously, there was more people in his army, and he could, if they amassed together, there's no way he'd have survived. So in order to gain credibility with the Persians... Alexander took on many Persian customs. So, for example, he began dressing like a Persian and he adopted the uh, practice of what was called pyrokinesis or proskinesis, which was a Persian court custom that involved bowing down and kissing the hand of others, depending on their rank. Now, the Macedonians who'd fought with Alexander all their lives, they were less than thrilled with these changes in Alexander and his attempt to be viewed as a deity, like as a god amongst men. So they refused to practice this, and some even plotted his death. So Alexander, by this point, was increasingly paranoid, and he ordered the death of, I mentioned his most esteemed general earlier, Parmenio, in 330, after Parmenio's son Philotas was convicted of uh, plotting an assassination attempt against Alexander, and he was also killed. So another couple of years later... uh, uh, one of Alexander's generals and another close friend of his, a man called Cletus, he met a violent end in 328. So he was fed up with Alexander's new Persian persona, and so when he was drunk, Cletus continually insulted Alexander and uh, minimised his achievements. And he was pushed too far in the end, Alexander, and he killed Cletus with a spear, which was a spontaneous act of violence that anguished him. So some historians believe that Alexander killed his general in a fit of drunkenness, which was uh, alcohol was a persistent problem that plagued Alexander through much of his life. So that's quite a plausible uh, way that he could have gone out in the end. Then, after that, Alexander struggled to capture the kingdom of Sogdia, which was a region of the Persian Empire that remained loyal to their general leader, who was called Bessus. And the Sogdians found a refuge at the pinnacle of a rock and refused Alexander's demand to surrender. So we obviously know by this point, Alexander was not one to take no for an answer. So he sent some of his men to scale this rock and take the Sogdians by surprise. And supposedly on that rock was a girl named Roxanne, who Alexander fell in love with on sight, and he married her despite her Sogdian heritage, and then she joined him on his journey. So the following year, in 327, Alexander decided to march on to India because that was where, if you remember earlier, I mentioned the limits of the Persian Empire had stretched over to. So Alexander marched on Punjab in India and some tribes surrendered peacefully, others didn't. And in 326, Alexander met King Porus of Porava at the Hidaspes River. 
Now Porus's army was less experienced than Alexander's, but they had a secret weapon that Alexander had encountered briefly before, elephants. So even so, after a fierce battle in a raging thunderstorm, and with his elephants, Porus was defeated. So one event did take place at Herdaspes, which is why I've mentioned it, and it devastated Alexander. And it was the death of his beloved horse, which you remember earlier I said the stallion he tamed when he was 12, Bucephalus. He, he died, so it's unclear if he died from battle wounds or of old age. But Alexander then founded a city and he named it after, after Bucephalus, he called it Bucephala. So at this point, Alexander was already in the, on the fringes of India and in the Punjab, and he wanted to press on and attempt to conquer all of India. But his soldiers had been fighting with him for nearly eight years at this point and they refused, they just flat out refused, and his officers convinced him to return to Persia. So Alexander led his troops down the Indus River, and he was severely wounded during a battle with a tribe called the Mali. And after recovering, he then divided his troops, sending half of them back to Persia, and half to Jedrosia, which was a desolate area west of the Indus River. So a couple of years later, he gets back to Persia, this is early 324, he reached the city of Susa, in Persia. Now he wanted to unite the Persians and Macedonians and create a new race which was loyal only to him, so he ordered a lot of his officers to marry Persian princesses at a mass wedding. He also took two more wives for himself because, well, because he could. So the Macedonian army resented Alexander's attempt to change their culture and many of them just mutinied in the end. But Alexander took a firm stand and he, re he replaced Macedonian officers and troops with Persians, so at that point his army backed down. And then to further diffuse the situation, Alexander returned their titles and he hosted a huge reconciliation banquet. So he managed to incorporate Persians and Macedons into his empire, which is something that a lot of other military leaders have since uh, struggled to do. So the last section we move on to is the death of Alexander the Great. Now, by 323... Alexander was head of an enormous empire and he'd recovered from the devastating loss of his friend Hephaestion, who was also reputed to be one of his homosexual male lovers. Now, thanks to his insatiable urge for world supremacy, he started plans then to conquer Arabia in 323, but unfortunately never uh, lived to see it happen. So after surviving numerous battles over the years, Alexander the Great died in June 323 and he was only aged 32. So some historians say that Alexander died of malaria or other natural causes, whereas others believe he was poisoned. Either way, he never named a successor. So his death and obviously the bloody infighting for control that happened afterwards had completely unravelled the empire he'd fought so hard to create. So I said that Alexander didn't leave any heirs behind. He didn't name a, have a named successor, but he left behind two dynasties from his generals, not from his own sons. So the first was from Seleucus, who was also about 32 at the time of Alexander's death. And he went on to find, found the Seleucid Empire, which lasted for 240 years. And the other was Ptolemy, who became king of Egypt. And this is arguably the more successful uh, dynasty, or more famous dynasty that was left behind. Because uh, he became king of Egypt and his family ruled for 293 years until his descendant Cleopatra's death in 30 BC. And this period was known as the Hellenistic period, especially in Greece. Not so much in Egypt, but in Greece, this sort of 300, to, 300 BC to Cleopatra's death in 30 BC was known as the Hellenistic period. So his legacy left behind, why was Alexander the Great great? So... Many of the conquered lands um, that Alexander conquered retained the Greek influence that he'd introduced, and several of the cities he founded still remain important to cultural centres even today, like Alexandria, for example, in Egypt. Um, you might have heard of the Library of Alexandria before that was famously burned down uh, years ago. Um, that was part of his legacy as well. So the period from his hist of history from his death to 30 odd BC like I mentioned was known as the Hellenistic period which comes from the word Hellazine which means to speak Greek or identify with the Greeks and this speaks highly along the sort of the ancient Roman empire I remember if you remember the last podcast some of those ancient Romans really tried to replicate the Greeks like Augustus even like Nero to an extent Caligula as well 
um, they tried to replicate what the the Greeks had done and achieved. And if you compare ancient Greece and ancient Rome, there's so many similarities because the Romans realised how successful the Greeks were and their most successful period was under Alexander the Great. So you could argue that, in fact, Alexander the Great single-handedly just about inspired the Roman Empire and for them to go on as long as they did. And obviously, as well as that, Alexander the Great is revered as one of the most powerful and influential leaders the ancient world has ever produced. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's a bit different for me doing ancient history because it's not something I'm that knowledgeable about. But it's certainly something I'm looking uh, to find a bit more information about and study a little more. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe, like, comment, share the video. You can visit my website now, which I've got set up, which is at www.historyin20.com. I'll post the links below to all my socials and the website as well. They'll be in the description. So if you want to check those out, feel free and share the video to your friends or anyone who might want to use it. Cheers, and I'll see you next time.